Well, good morning. It certainly is good to be back home, be back in the state of Utah, and good to be back with all of you. Uh, Haley and I definitely enjoyed our travels, enjoyed our trip, but it, it is so good to be back with all of you here at Kaysville. I say you would have your Bible out if it's not out already. And go ahead and be in Philippians chapter 2. Just back up a few chapters. Philippians chapter 2. We'll be looking at that text in just a moment. It is good, as Paul mentioned earlier in the announcements, we do have a lot that are visiting with us this morning. We're certainly uh, glad to have you here with us. If time permits in your schedules, if you can just stick around a little bit afterwards so we can get to know you, uh, we would appreciate that. We have a lot of people visiting this morning, and that is a blessing, something that encourages us here. Hope that you'll be edified by our worship. When I say the name Epaphroditus, and uh, hey, Dennis, I think this is the, an old PowerPoint. Uh, we're not going to be talking about grace again, as much as I would love to. We're going to actually be talking about Epaphroditus this morning. And when I say the name Epaphroditus, does that ring any bells in your head? Uh, some of you maybe you've never heard that name at all, and that's okay. Some of you, maybe you've heard the name, uh, but you can't really tell any detail about who Epaphroditus is. As one of you teased with me this morning, when, saying that when you saw the outline that it, we were going to be talking about Epaphroditus, you were wondering, you know, what medical condition we were going to be talking about. You know... And if you don't know anything about Epaphroditus, that's, that's okay. That's going to make my job really easy this morning because I have two goals and why well, I wanted to do a lesson about Epaphroditus. First is just to simply inform us about who this man is. Uh, tell, do a little bit of a character study. Let us know a little bit about what Scripture says about him. But also, secondly, I want us to see why there is a need for there to be men and women like Epaphroditus in the church today. Why you and I should be striving to be like this man. Like this man that there's just actually not a lot said about. There's only two times that he's mentioned in Scripture. One of them was read in the Scripture reading by Jordan for us in Philippians chapter 4. But the other is in Philippians chapter 2, and that's where I want to read with you now. Philippians chapter 2, we're going to read the last couple verses of that chapter, beginning in verse 25. So Philippians chapter 2 in verse 25. It says, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he, has long, for he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you, because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but, all, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious." So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. As I mentioned earlier, only two verses in the Bible mention Epaphroditus. And so I want to just give you a quick overview about what we know about Epaphroditus, summarizing from this passage in chapter 4. Epaphroditus is sent from the church at Philippi to go to Paul while he is imprisoned at Rome. And while Paul is imprisoned at Rome, Epaphroditus is sending to him not just money, but from what we can infer uh, in chapter 4, I think some of the, the fruit, some of the gifts that he is bringing is also simply put just some, uh, some food, some necessities of life, which we're going to talk about later on. But while Epaphroditus is on this trip, something happens. He gets sick. And the, the fact uh, the, that this text says that he almost died. And that news traveled all the way back to Philippi, but not the fact that Epaphroditus got better. And so both parties, Paul and Epaphroditus in, uh, at Rome, are stressed about this. They're anxious. And then the brethren at Philippi are anxious and stressed about this as well, as well, because they don't know. They only heard that Epaphroditus was sick. They don't know that he's gotten better. 
And so Epaphroditus is just kind of, you know, itching to get back to Philippi. So that, that way everybody can know that he is well. And that's kind of a simple overview of what we know about him. But there's some other descriptions in this text that we just looked at that reveal a little bit about who Epaphroditus was. And notice in verse 25 is where we're going to pull out some of those descriptions from Philippians chapter 2, where we see that Epaphroditus is called a brother. And so is this saying that he's the actual physical blood brother of Paul? I don't think so. This word is used a lot just in the book of Philippians. And when this word is used, it's showing a relationship between Christians. And it's used in these passages on the screen as either a brother or brethren, replying to brothers and sisters in Christ. And this is a simple point, but it lets us know that Epaphroditus is a Christian. He's a brother in Christ, which shows a kind of a natural conclusion for why everybody's so worried about each other. They're a family. And that's what family does. They show concern. They show care for one another. And so we see on the outskirts that Epaphroditus is a Christian. He's a brother in Christ. But we also see that he is a fellow worker. And so in some capacity, and don't quiz me on this afterwards, we're not just told that much about Epaphroditus. I don't know in every capacity how he served as a fellow worker in the gospel. But he was. That's how Paul viewed him, at least. That, that phrase, fellow worker, in the Greek, is the word synergon. And that word sounds probably familiar in our English language. That's where we get the word synergy from. That we work better with other people than we do by ourselves. We're more efficient that way. Let, let me share with you a quick story that illustrates that. In Oklahoma, we have a visitor from Oklahoma and some other families that like the state of Oklahoma, I was reading about that they do a lot of uh, horse pulling competitions. Maybe Paul and Robin can fill us in on that later. But they, they try and see how much weight a single horse can pull. And in this competition, the winning horse pulled 5,000 pounds, and the second place horse pulled 4,000 pounds. And so after the competition was done, what they did is they put the first and second place horse together to see how much weight they could pull together. Now, simple math would tell us the answer is they pulled 9,000 pounds, but they didn't. They pulled 12,000 pounds. And that, that's a good illustration that lets us know that we work better with other people. That, that's the idea of synergy. That's the idea of how Epaphroditus, what he was to Paul. He was a fellow, fellow worker. A fellow worker that caused the total to be more than the sum of the parts. But in a similar manner, he's not just a fellow worker, he's a fellow soldier. An idea, this idea of being a soldier, we've been talking a lot about this in our theme, of fighting the good fight. But the word for soldier here is a little bit different. It, it literally means a fellow struggler. Somebody who's just getting through. Somebody that's willing to get their hands dirty. And that's what Epaphroditus is doing with Paul. A mentality that's greatly needed if you're going to reach the loss, if you're going to be about the business of the kingdom. And there's a passage that I think pairs well with this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, speaking about this idea of what a soldier goes through. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, it says, Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. And I think that passage points out a lot about the character of who Epaphroditus is. Part of the reason why he's going to Rome from Philippi. That's not an easy journey to make if you have a map in the back of your Bible. Not an easy journey to make. And why he's willing to do all this and risk his life is because he's not trying to please Paul. It's not because he's trying to please the elders at Philippi. He's trying to please the Lord, the one who enlisted him. What else do we see in verse 25 about Epaphroditus? We see that he is a messenger. That word for messenger is the same Greek word we see in the, the New Testament for apostle. And now I'm not saying that, that Epaphroditus is an apostle, but it's the same word. In context, will reveal to us how that word is being used. Simply put, to be an apostle is one that is sent out. And we see oftentimes in the New Testament, especially in the epistles, 
This word is used when someone is a messenger from one congregation to another, or someone is sent to fulfill a need in an area. And I think that's what we see Epaphroditus is serving as here. That he is a messenger of sorts, maybe of the gospel as well, but also from Philippians chapter 4, he is a messenger of funds in what he is providing for Paul. And what we also see, one of the last terms we'll look at there in verse 25, is he's a minister. You're in your messenger and minister to my need. You know, it's funny how words change over the years. We, we probably see that happen in our own lives. Words that once meant something 20 years ago don't mean the same thing that they mean today. And the word minister has changed so much, not just in the past 20 years, but since it was used in the New Testament times. You know, the term minister was never intended to be a title, but rather a description. And now instead of calling someone a preacher or evangelist, we simply call them a minister. But really, there's a sense where all of us as Christians, we better be, we should be ministers. Because who is someone that's a minister? Well, it's somebody that takes on the role of a public servant. Somebody who is willing to serve other people. And that's who Epaphroditus is. He's a servant. And to minister and to serve others, that's going to require some personal sacrifice. It's going to require some expenses to be made on your behalf. You know, the Apostle Paul, as I mentioned... During this time that Philippians, this letter is penned, Paul is in prison at Rome. And maybe you've studied this before, maybe you haven't, but the prison system of first century Rome is nothing like our prison system today. If you were a prisoner in first century Rome, they didn't provide for your food. They didn't give you a a bed. You know, they didn't make life comfortable for you, kind of like our prison system does a little bit today. They provide for those necessities. The only way if you were a prisoner in Rome that that you were able to really survive prison is if you had friends and family to provide you with food, to give you water. And some of you might be thinking, well, what if somebody didn't have water? I mean, didn't have friends, didn't have family to support them. They didn't last long. They did not last in that setting. And so prisoners depended on people to serve them, to bring them things so that they could survive. And that's what Epaphroditus is doing for Paul here. He isn't just providing simply money. He is providing Paul with the necessities of life. And I want us to understand that. And so when we look on the surface, you know, you you might have looked at the handout and being like, Epaphra, who, you know, like, who are we going to talk about? We don't really know that much. We only have a few sections of Scripture that reveal about him and kind of the setting and what's happening. But we have enough information to start to get in our head a little bit about who this man is. And hopefully with just what we've covered so far, I hope you can see why we should be striving to be like someone like Epaphroditus. But as we close, I want to make some applications by posing a little bit of a question, you know, what would Epaphroditus look like in the church today? What, what, what would somebody that was like Epaphroditus, what would they look like here at Kaysville today? And as we do, as we kind of consider what this would look like, we're also going to continue to study Epaphroditus himself. And the first point being, I think it would be someone who could be trusted. And I hate putting points up like this because it sounds so simplistic, like, you know, Almost like you're, you're describing a dog, you know, a golden retriever that's trustworthy. It, sound, it sounds so simple, but hear me out for a second. A large part of what Epaphroditus was responsible for was being a messenger. And as we mentioned earlier, probably not in the same sense as being a messenger of the gospel, but also a messenger of funds from Philippi to Rome. And I think that reveals a lot about his character. Because if you're going to send something of any importance, you're not going to just pick any average Joe. You're going to pick somebody that you can trust to deliver funds, to deliver food. Proverbs 26 and verse 6 says it this way, Whoever sends a message by the hand of a fool cuts off his own feet and drinks violence verse, again, backs up the idea that that you don't send a message by someone who is thought to be a fool. You don't send a message by someone that you can't trust. You make sure, rather, that a message is sent by someone that is reliable, someone that you can depend on. 
And that is especially true when we consider Epaphroditus and the role that he was selected to serve for the saints at Philippi. I want you to consider the large amount of degree of trust that would be required to send somebody with probably a large amount of money from Philippi to Rome. Think about it in a time where they didn't have cell phones, they didn't get a notification, you know, once the funds had been delivered, they didn't get electronic transfers or anything like that. It was delivered in person. You want to know how they typically would, you know, try and certify the amounts that were sent from one place to another during that time? They would get a a piece of paper of sorts, and they would write down how much money was being sent, and they would have a few different people sign it. And they would put that in the bag, and then they would send the person on their way. You know how easy that would be to manipulate? Maybe change, you know, if it's $5,000, to change that to four. And then the person that's sending it can take his cut, you know, put it in his pocket, and no one would ever know. Again, I hope you can just see, hopefully that illustrates how important it is that you need to pick someone that you can trust. But as we think about this, I want you to ask yourself, would you be trusted for a job like this? Has the conduct of your character given you a reputation that you could be trusted in any capacity of any importance? You know, what do people think about your character? Sadly, I think some Christians are not as trustworthy as they should be. Maybe they wouldn't be leaned upon for a responsibility of this stature. Understand, I, I'm not trying to say that I think the elders are looking out to find somebody to go, uh, you know, with an envelope down to Belize or Colombia to deliver. I, I don't think that's what I'm saying at all. Rather, more and more simply, do brethren here trust you to do your part? Can they reach out to you when they need something? Con- consider a few examples with me. Men, when, when you're on the duty roster... Can Dennis and the elders, can can they depend on you that you will be present and available to serve? Maybe when you sign up to teach a Bible class, can you be counted on to show up and lead minds in the study of God's Word? When your service group coordinators, you know, plan a meeting or a project, are you someone that they can depend on, that they can count and say that, I know that person's going to be there? Maybe when Mark, you know, as the deacon in charge of visitor services, when he needs help writing a card, can he, can he trust that when he gives you this card that he knows that that card's actually going to get written and sent? What about all the other areas that we have responsibilities as members of the body of Christ? Can, can people trust us? Can people depend on us? I hope that we would be trusted because of our character, because of our reputation. You know, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 2, in a passage that talks about the qualifications of elders, it begins by saying, therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. And that's the same thing that appears first in the list in Titus chapter 1, in the qualifications of a shepherd, someone that serves as an elder. That they're above reproach, they're above board, meaning that they are trustworthy. People aren't given any reason to doubt them because of their character. And I think it's worth noting as a quick side point, that's why elders and deacons are natural fits to handle the Lord's money because of their character, because of the qualifications listed in 1 Timothy 3 in Titus chapter 1. But this should not just be the standard of elders. This should be a goal for all of us as Christians. And so again, I want us to consider, are you trustworthy? Are you reliable by the merits of your character? by the merits of your conduct. But second, I think something else that an Epaphroditus in the Lord's church today would look like is someone that's committed to the work of the Lord. I appreciate Zach for leading the song that he did. I want to be a worker for the Lord. And that's, that's somebody that I get from the few verses we have about Epaphroditus. That's who he was. He was a worker, but not just a worker, a worker for the Lord. You know, there's so many characters in the New Testament that we read about, and maybe we know a name, maybe we don't even know a name, and I just wish we had more details. What, what are the battles that Epaphroditus faced behind the scenes? I don't know. I don't know that. 
But from what we can see is that he is more than just a good guy. He is a devoted worker to the Lord. Read, read with me again a little bit about what is said about this. Philippians 2, 29 through 30, where it says, So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Serving the Lord and doing the Lord's work that came at a cost for Epaphroditus, a cost that almost, almost cost him his life, something that he was willing to risk. Again, that says so much, that reveals so much about his character for us. And there's a special notice in the Greek language in these verses that it's not just the work that he's doing, but it's there in verse 30 where it says, for he nearly died for the work of Christ. That's almost given an emphasis in the Greek language. The work that he's doing, it's for the work of Christ. And brethren, what that ser should serve as for us is a reminder that doing our work for the Lord, it's going to take personal sacrifice. It should cost us. And I know we don't like that as Americans. We don't like that, uh, that idea that, that we're going to have to give something up that we're going to have to make a sacrifice. But that's a prerequisite for what it means to be a Christian, to be self-sacrificial, to deny ourselves, to deny our wants. And we have a hard time with that. We don't like to give things up. But Philippians 2 and verse 30, Epaphroditus, he nearly died for the work of Christ. And that is why such men are worthy of honor. You know, the life of Epaphroditus shows us that Christianity, it is stern and it is demanding. And we need more men. We need more women in the kingdom who embody the spirit of Epaphroditus among us. Because it's not just the spirit of Epaphroditus. It's a reflection of Christ. A little bit earlier, in the first couple of verses of Philippians 2, it talks about the humility of Christ and what he was willing to do in going to the cross. And then you get to the end of the chapter and you read about a Christian who embodies that. This is why I think it is so worthy for us to strive to be like Epaphroditus in our own lives. G giving little thought to my personal comfort. And instead of focusing not just on others, but the kingdom of God. I mean, can you, can you just imagine for a second, can you imagine what this congregation would be like if each and every one of us had the mentality that we were willing to risk our lives for the work of Christ? How, how much stronger would we be? We wouldn't need a new building in a couple months. We would need a new building next Sunday. You know, and as I say that, you know, our, our shepherds do have plans to expand this building. But I think it would be lazy for us as members if our mentality is we, we're going to sit back and just hope, maybe even pray that a family or two moves into the area. You know, help, help, that maybe that will help fill the space. Rather, I think we need to be a people who are committed to Jesus and his word, actively seeking the loss. Maybe you aren't the best at teaching someone. Well, we got a lot of great teachers here. Reach out to someone. Let's be a worker for the Lord. Let's be committed. Let's be devoted to the Lord and his kingdom. And as we finish this morning, what would Epaphroditus look like in the church today? As we reflect on these verses and the character of Epaphroditus, I think it would look like someone who is loving toward others. And again, another very simple point, but hear me out. Look at what is said about him again. Philippians 2, 25 through 28. It says, I have thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but, also, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. This week as I was reading and prepping for this lesson, I, I was reading over these verses and I couldn't help but think about what it would have been like that first Sunday back when Epaphroditus came to town. Can you imagine what it would have been like at worship that Sunday when Epaphroditus was there? 
That it's probably the, the Sunday that song leaders just dream about. About the singing was great. I mean, the tears, the hugs, the kisses, the embraces that would have been taking place. As everybody is reunited. Philippians 2, 25 through 28 shows us that everybody involved in this text is going to benefit by the return of Epaphroditus the Philippi. Uh, think, think about that for a second. Who is going to benefit from that first? Epaphroditus himself is going to benefit. Verse 26 says that he has been longing. He's had a yearning to get back to the brethren. And to the point that in verse 26, he's been stressing about this. He's been distressed. Sometimes in the Bible it says that we should be anxious for nothing. And then in other places we read that Paul and other brethren were stressed all the time. Oftentimes it comes down to what are we stressed about? Are we stressed about ourselves or are we stressed about other people? And I think we see a righteous concern for others. And that's what Epaphroditus is experiencing. That he has anxiety about the anxiety of the Philippians. And so he can't wait to get back and to relieve their fears. And that's somebody that is motivated by wanting to help others. Somebody that knows about love. But who, who else is going to benefit from this? Well, the saints at Philippi are going to benefit. Can you imagine what their prayers were like every Sunday? And of course, when they had Bible study on Wednesday too. You no, know, I'm sure that they were constantly making prayers on Epaphroditus' behalf. And to see him again, to see him well, to see him healthy, they would have rejoiced at that. That's what we see in verse 28. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again. This is someone they care deeply about, but we also see Paul is going to benefit from this. Paul, his, in verse 27 and 28, Paul's going to be less anxious once he knows that Epaphroditus gets back to Philippi. He's going to know that the saints at Philippi are better. He's going to know that Epaphroditus is better, and as a result, he's going to sleep a little bit better at night. Everybody benefits from Epaphroditus getting back to Philippi. And as I think about that, I can't help but, but notice that this man must have had a pretty big impact on other people. There's a lot of unnamed people in the Bible, and a lot of people that are mentioned just once or twice, just like Epaphroditus. And from what we can infer, what we can pull out from the text, this is a man that made an impact on others. But a question for us, you know, how do you impact the lives of others. What, what impact are you making on the congregation here at Kaysville? You know, having a true impact on others, it doesn't happen accidentally. Because a large part of that is going to require us to express and to show love in every facet of our lives. Love is a verb. It requires action. You don't just wake up one morning being patient. You, you don't just forgive wrongs and bear with annoying people just because. It requires work. It requires a love motivated by the Savior and by our Lord. And we need more Christians in the kingdom of God that, you know, have this attitude of Epaphroditus. Have this attitude for fellow Christians, the longing to see them, being troubled at what others feel because of what I'm going through. A selflessness, a concern, and a love for others. Now, as I reflected on Epaphroditus this week, it made me so much more thankful for this congregation here, but also Christians around the world, that there are so many men and women that serve in this capacity, that are devoted and committed to the work of the Lord like Epaphroditus. It also teaches me that there's a lot of workers in the kingdom that They'll never get their name shouted out. They may not receive the honor that they deserve, but know that God, God knows all. God sees all. And continue to serve, continue to do the work of the Lord. You know, if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, I hope you know that Christ died that you might be saved. And through His blood, we can have our sins washed away. We become a new man, a new creation in Christ. 
And it's at that point, that, that conversion, that transformation that takes place that would cause someone to live such a radical life, to be willing to risk their life to help other people like Epaphroditus. And maybe you're here this morning and you're ready to begin that walk, to begin your walk with Christ, repenting of your sins and being baptized. We would love, be happy to assist you with that. And so if you're here in the subject, Evan's invitation anyway, I invite you to come to the front as we stand and sing the song. So let it be.